Welcome to episode 57 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And Dad represents the delivery. Recognizing tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today and then applying that to those around me. I'm your host, DL, and this episode is Bills, 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 where I spend the entire episode catching up on some bill reviews. For one reason or another, I opted to skip the bill review and a few previous episodes, and I wanted to catch up on them. And let me tell you, there is never a shortage of bills to catch up on. My first question was if I could pull off an entire episode of bill reviews without putting people to sleep. Well, why don't we find out? But I know I'll be a law someday, at least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. The goal of the bill review is to promote the idea that everyday Americans can and should take the time to read any legislation, order, or mandate. Since I am not a lawyer, this is not a legal interpretation, and I may be wildly wrong. Bills range from a page or two to many thousands of pages long. And since they can be rather dry, I usually keep this segment in the show, but smaller. But today, as I said, I'm making an entire show about bill reviews. So, let's do this. This episode, I'm going to tackle three bills. Florida HB1, Combating Public Disorder. Florida HB1475, Fairness in Women's Sports Act. And U.S. Senate Bill 937, COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. Wherever you're watching from, feel free to drop a comment and let me know what you think. And if you enjoy the show, subscribe to me on YouTube, where you can catch all my shows. All right, let's get into that first bill. Florida's HB1, House Bill 1, Combating Public Disorder, also known as the Anti-Riot Bill. This bill is 61 pages long, but it amends 16 current statutes, creates four, and so much of the bill is current uh, statutes, uh, so much of the bill is current statutes, so it, you know, to add context. Sorry, getting a little fumbled there. There is still a fair amount, though, since it references approximately 111 other statutes. There are two areas that I find particularly troubling with this bill, which was already signed into law. The first is the section that amends statute 166.241. Here's what the addition says. If the tentative budget of a municipality contains a funding reduction to the operating budget of the municipal law enforcement agency, the state attorney for the judicial circuit in which the municipality is located or a member of the governing body who objects to the funding reduction may file an appeal by petition to the Administration Commission within 30 days after the day the tentative budget is posted to the official website of the municipality under subsection 3. Okay, basically, if a municipality proposes a budget cut to law enforcement, there is a means to challenge it at the state level. This is meant to prevent the various defund the police movements that we've seen in the news over the last roughly year. If you're a law and order type, you might find this appealing, but you should still find this concerning for two reasons. One, it reduces home rule, which is basically a concept that allows cities and municipalities to determine their own law our laws and govern themselves so long as they follow state and federal constitutionality. The idea is pretty simple. Citizens who live in those municipalities ought to have the strongest say in how they are governed. Those in law enforcement have more weight in taxation than do citizens. But that's not readily apparent until we get to the next section I take issue with. Here's what that section says. A municipality has a duty to allow the municipal law enforcement agency to respond appropriately to protect persons and property during a riot or an unlawful assembly based on the availability of adequate equipment 
to its municipal law enforcement officers and relevant state and federal laws. If the governing body of a municipality or a person authorized by the governing body of the municipality breaches that duty, the municipality is civilly liable for any damages, including damages arising from personal injury, wrongful death, or property damages, proximately caused by municipalities breach of duty. Okay, that was a lot. So here's my summarized interpretation. If the local municipality interferes with law enforcement's ability to protect people or property during a riot or an unlawful assembly, they can be held civilly liable. In other words, I can sue city, the city of Jacksonville for destruction to my business if I feel that their actions prevented law enforcement from adequately protecting my property during a riot. But Liberty Dad, deal. That sounds like a good idea. That's what we have police for, right? Well, here's the thing. Riots and unlawful assemblies can be kind of hard to predict. Many cities had uh, Black Lives Matter protests that turned into riots, while many did not. But often, riots and unlawful assemblies start out as legitimate protests that take a turn for the worst. Imagine law enforcement requests additional funding, but they're denied. Will they later claim that such denial prevented them from protecting property or an individual? More importantly, is there a similar statute that says law enforcement can be held liable for failure to utilize their available or existing resources adequately? The answer to my knowledge is no, there isn't. The real problem here is that no one wants to be held liable for an event they cannot predict. Therefore, it's more likely that municipalities will increase budgets of local law enforcement just to ensure that they have the sufficient resources, even if it's too many. In other words, you might think of it like this, better to have and not need than to need and not have. But that isn't all. Here in Jacksonville last year in 2020, the mayor declared a state of emergency over a small outbreak of violence during a protest. Because he declared a state of emergency, he was able then to is issue an executive order declaring a citywide curfew to prevent further violence. He was heavily criticized by both the Libertarian and Democratic parties here in Jacksonville. The real problem here is that no one wants to be held liable for an event they cannot predict. Therefore, it's more likely that municipalities will increase budgets of local law enforcement to ensure they have the sufficient resources, even if too many. But that isn't all. Here in Jacksonville last year in 2020, the mayor declared a state of emergency over a small outbreak of violence during a protest. Because he declared a state of emergency, he was able then to issue an executive order declaring a citywide curfew to prevent further violence. He was heavily criticized by both the Libertarian and Democratic parties here in Jacksonville because the violence was limited to a relatively small area and the citywide curfew appeared excessive, particularly since Jacksonville is a very large city by area. Now, I want you to consider what happens since municipalities can be held civilly liable. We might reasonably expect more declarations of a state of emergency and more executive orders at the slightest hint of any unrest. It's better to be safe than sorry. That's my first major issue. The second is that this bill adds or amends multiple sections to permit people who are arrested for violations during a riot or unlawful assembly to be held in custody until they are brought to court. We see this on page 16 between lines 377 and 389 where it adds a section called mob intimidation. And here's what that says. It is unlawful for a person assembled with two or more person, two or more other persons and acting with a common intent to use force or threaten to use imminent force to compel or induce or attempt to compel or induce another person to do or refrain from doing any act or to assume, ab abandon, or maintain a particular viewpoint against his or her will. Then goes on to say, A person arrested for a violation of this section shall be held in custody until brought before the court for admittance to bail in accordance with Chapter 
1-800-273-9903. In other words, if you are arrested for violating this new section, you will be brought uh, you will be held in custody until you are brought to court to determine bail. I'm not particularly a fan of this because I prefer the government only detain people when they absolutely must, particularly prior to being found guilty of a crime. Now, moving along, on page 26, lines 647 through 651, it adds similar text saying, a person arrested for committing a theft during a riot or an aggravated riot or within a county that is subject to a state of emergency may not be released until the person appears before a committing magistrate at a first appearance hearing. Remember a moment ago, I expressed concern about increasing the use of state uh, emergency uh, state of emergency powers by local government to protect against, protect against civil liability? This amendment requires a person to be detained until their first hearing. Requires. If you think that sounds great, after all, this whole nonsense idea of you shouldn't have broke the law, you would be wise to remember that just because you are arrested does not mean that you are necessarily guilty. It's entirely possible that someone lawfully attends a protest, is arrested for suspected theft, and ends up with various other problems due to being detained. There's more to this bill, but it would, would require a deeper dive into existing statutes to really get a good sense of the impact. Ultimately, I oppose this bill, despite it being signed into law already, because it allows the state to override what citizens may want locally. I find that particularly interesting given the argument between state and federal authority, which is a larger version of this same issue. While it doesn't require municipalities to govern with a heavy hand, it does offer incentive to do so by making them potentially liable for negative outcomes and gives law enforcement even more reason to arrest and detain people. And it kind of gives law, you know, earlier I said something to the effect that it gives law enforcement a little more weight than citizens. Well, if law enforcement says we need more money and the citizens say, no, you don't, the civil liability could put the city in a situation where they're going to lean on or listen to the law enforcement more. In other words, it expands policing while limiting citizens from deciding how they wish to be governed. We have a term for that in the libertarian community. We call it a police state. I'd like to now turn our attention to Florida House Bill 1475, the Fairness in Women's Sports Act. This bill came to my attention from seeing a number of news articles and people on social media claiming that this bill requires inspection of genitals, some even equating it to pedophilia or sexual assault. That, of course, got my attention. The bill is five pages long, so a relatively quick read. We get a good sense of what this bill will do on lines four through seven on the first page. There, it says this that certain athletic teams or sports sponsored by certain educational institutions be designated on the basis of students' biological sex. It's basically an attempt to prevent transgender males from participating in sports dedicated to female sports. On page 2, we find the legislative intent declared in lines 34 through 41, saying this, it is the intent of the legislature to maintain opportunities for female athletes to demonstrate their skill, strength, and athletic abilities, while also providing them with opportunities to obtain recognition and accolades, college scholarships, and the numerous other long-term benefits that result from success, from success in athletic endeavors, and to promote sex equality by requiring the designation of separate sex-specific athletic teams or sports. <clears throat> Before we even get to any issues of sex, gender, transgender, students, or equality, I already have problems with this bill. While the government may be currently doing so, or at least attempting it, it is my firm belief that the role of government is not, and I do repeat and, and, and please, is not to maintain opportunities for female athletes to demonstrate their athletic skill, much less provide any reward for doing so. The same goes for male athletes as well. I also disagree that it is the government's role to promote sex equality for the very reason this bill exists. 
And that's because what constitutes sex equality is being heavily debated right now. So as long as your side is winning that debate, eh, you're probably okay with it. But the problem, of course, is for the side that is losing. And it really doesn't matter who is right because it becomes a matter of who has the power. But let's dive into this bill a little bit more. Unlike the transgender bills from Alabama and Arkansas that I reviewed in past episodes, this bill relies solely on sex as a legal characteristic. Observations over the gender and sex debate suggest that opponents kind of got bit on this one since many have claimed that sex and gender are distinct and that gender is a social construct. This bill sidesteps that by simply using sex as the distinguishing characteristic. It first distinguishes teams on the basis of sex identifying one of three types, male, female, and co-ed. This is where the issue of inspecting genitals comes into play. <clears throat> on page 3, between lines 55 and 68, it states the following. A dispute regarding a student's sex shall be resolved by the student's school or institution by requesting that the student provide a health examination or, and consent form or other statement signed by the student's personal health care provider, which must verify the student's biological sex. The health care provider may verify the student's biological sex as part of a routine sports physical examination by relying on one or more of the following. The student's reproductive anatomy, the student's genetic makeup, or the student's normal endogenously produced testosterone levels. <clears throat> I think opponents who are calling this a genital inspection bill tantamount to pedophilia or sexual assault are doing themselves a huge disservice. The, the way many have worded it make it sound like the inspection will be done by the school officials. But that isn't true. It requires a healthcare provider to include that examination as part of a sports physical examination. And that is what healthcare providers do. They examine the body based on whatever is the need or any symptoms that are presented. Many males will tell you a sports physical often comes with placement of fingers in an uncomfortable place while being asked to turn their head and cough. This is to determine if the person has any sign of inguinal hernia, which can be exacerbated by the rigors of sports involvement. So viewers know that I'm not just exaggerating how this bill is being presented or was. Consider this headline by Pink News in the UK. Quote, Florida advances a sick bill that would let school, uh, schools inspect teens' genitals in the name of transphobia. Or this snippet, from a petition on change.org with over 42,000 signatures. Quote, this bans trans girls and women to play on school teams. It would also allow schools to require a genital inspection of student athletes suspected to be trans. This is sexual assault, plain and simple. People can be so ignorant and disgusting. This is violating women, particularly trans women. I would never let anyone inspect my child. For that ridiculous reason. But that's absurd. Of course you'd let your physician inspect, examine, if we're using a little less charged language, your child. That's the whole point of a doctor or healthcare provider. While the bill appears to be dead in this session, opponents might reconsider how they present their arguments. They risk looking a little foolish by suggesting an examination by doctors is the equivalent to sexual assault. Non-trans students are examined by doctors all the time to meet requirements by the, uh, states, uh, by the state or governing authority of various sports teams or leagues. Now, let's move along to page 4, lines 79 through 84, where it includes wording similar to the previous bill, HB1. Any student who is deprived of an athletic opportunity or suffers any direct or indirect harm as a result of a violation of this section shall have a private cause of action for injunctive relief, damages, or any other relief available under law against the school or po public post-secondary institution. It provides liability for students who believe uh, an opportunity has been taken from them. Like HB1, nobody wants to be liable. 
and will take extra precaution to try and protect themselves. Now, what might that look like? Well, go back up a bit to page 3 uh, and 4, uh, lines 70 through 77, and we see the following. A governmental entity, any licensing or accrediting organization, or any athletic association or organization may not entertain a complaint, open investigation, or take any other adverse action against any school or public post-secondary institution for maintaining separate interscholastic, intercollegiate, intramural, or club athletic teams or sports for students of the female sex. Seems to me this insulates schools against any complaint if they were to simply make all students subject to an examination and then exclude anyone whose examination does not fit the requirements. And that's a problem because any trans students who might want to participate in a sport designated for their biological sex will not only be required to get an examination, but that information will now be provided to the school. And if it's a requirement for all students, arguments that it unfairly targets trans students has a little bit less strength. Protecting trans students is an admirable goal, but I'm not impressed how advocates are going about it. The arguments, they seem specious, even a bit self-defeating long-term. I think far better, it would have been wise for opponents of such bills to take the position that I mentioned at the very beginning of reviewing this bill and simply say, it's not the job of government to maintain opportunities to demonstrate athletic skill or rewards for doing so for either male or female athletes, however defined. When legislating equality in areas outside the law, such as opportunities to display skill, it becomes a precarious fight and opens the door for many other problems. Now, let's take a look at the last bill. United States Senate Bill 93, the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. This bill is 24 pages long and starts by reviewing a couple of its findings. On page 2, lines 6 through 14, it says, Following the spread of COVID-19 in 2020, there has been a dramatic increase in hate crimes and violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Since my wife is from Indonesia and my son is visibly Asian, this gets my attention. I have a personally invested interest in a potential increase in hate crimes and violence against Asians, as it may affect my family. It goes on to state, According to re a recent report, there were nearly 3,800 reported cases of anti-Asian discrimination and incidents related to COVID-19 between March 19, 2020 and February 28, 2021 in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Whew, that certainly sounds like quite a bit, right? But what does that 3,800 number mean when it says discrimination and incidents. Well, it turns out we can look at the report which comes from Stop AAI, AAPI Hate, that's uh, Asian American Pacific Islander Hate. On page three of their report, it shows that of the reported incidents, 68.1% were verbal harassment or name calling, 20.5% were avoidance or shunning, and 11.1% were physical assault. The report then cites specific examples of the above categories. I'd like to read one from each category. Okay, so we're going to start with verbal harassment or name calling. Okay, so here's the report that was given to Stop AAIP Hate. I was shopping in Milpitas when an older man started making faces at me. I asked him, what was wrong? And he said, what's wrong? You are out here shopping. I was confused and he followed up with, we delisted your companies. Ship back your international students. When do you ship out? When do you ship out? We are going to take away your citizenship. Now, let's go to the next one here real quick, and we'll talk about these in a moment. Avoidance and shunning. Here's that story. I came into the tea coffee shop at Mercado, and people started leaving the area where I sat one by one. People started coming in, and they sat on the other side of the coffee shop, away from me. I became isolated on one side of the coffee shop. And now, let's, let's, let's hear from the physical assault story. My boyfriend and I were riding the metro into D.C. 
When on the escalator in the transfer station, a man repeatedly punched my back and pushed against us. At the top, he circled back toward us, followed us, repeatedly shouting, Chinese bitch, at me. Fake coughed at and physically threatened us. A few days later, we saw a news story about how the owner of Valley Brook Tea in D.C. was harassed and pepper sprayed by the same man who had called him COVID-19 repeatedly. Right away, I have some red flags. All of the stories are examples of very foul behavior and should never be tolerated. That people may have watched and not said anything is its own problem. The red flags for me are that the bill was drafted on the basis of this report where 88.6 of the incidents were people acting like terrible people. Calling people names, saying horrible things to them, and not sitting with them are simply not crimes, nor should we see them as such. Punching someone's back, fake coughing on someone, pandemic or not, and physically threatening them are definitely acts of aggression. But incidents like that make up only 11%. In fairness, I would include other categories similarly, such as coughed at, spat upon, and vandalism. But I do understand why they are distinct in the report. When we add those categories, this brings the number from 11% to 25%. And if anybody happens to look at the report, you may see some slight discrepancy in the numbers, and that's because I think that some of these incidents overlap. So you might see a particular incident would have been in more than one category at, the, at a time. Of the 3,795 reported incidents, 963 are of the type that might warrant some government attention. I include barring people from transportation or establishments only because of current laws in place. But see episode 45, where I discuss freedom of association in depth as it relates to a pillar of libertarianism. <clears throat> Okay, so one of the drivers of this bill, the report from Stop AAIP Hate. <coughs> okay, so one of the drivers of this bill, the report from Stop AAIP Hate, is in question, but only in the context of promoting government involvement. What about the rest of the bill? Maybe the bill itself has value for the 963 incidents that do warrant government attention. Under the section findings, the bill goes on to state that race is cited as the primary reason for discrimination, making up over 90% of the incidents, and that 36% of them took place at a business, and then gives some more data regarding the number of Asian American businesses and Asian Americans and their English proficiency. Before I continue, let's be very clear what the bill has declared so far in the first three pages. First of all, it is called the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. It then uses information from Stop AAIP Hate as its basis. And both of these will be relevant in just a moment, so keep them in the back of your mind. Section 5 is where we get to what this bill actually does. It's titled the Jabara Hire No Hate Act named after the killing of Lebanese man named Khalid Jabara by his neighbor and the killing of Heather Heyer, who was run down during the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. In subsection B on page 5 uh, and 6, under findings it says, The incidence of violence, known as hate crimes or crimes motivated by bias, poses a serious national problem. <clears throat> According to data obtained by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the incidence of such violence increased in 2019, the most recent year for which data is available. If you recall, back on page 2 under this same bill, it found that there has been a dramatic increase in hate crimes and violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. This bill gets its inform only information from Stop AAIP Hate, who collected reports between March 19th, 2020, and February 28th, 2021. In other words, hate crimes have increased dramatically in 2020 from 2019. While it is certainly possible that COVID-19 has fueled resentment towards Asian Americans, we are only working with two years of data. And some of that data included things like verbal insults, online insults, and shunning, which made up over 70% of the incidents. 
the question becomes whether or not there really is a dramatic rise in hate crimes once we remove incidents that may be foul behavior but are not a crime. Telling someone you want to deport them or telling them to go back to their country or even refusing to sit near them. It's contemptuous, but it's not a crime. And that is important because in lines 13 through 17, in subsection 4, it says this, a more complete understanding of the national problem posed by hate crime is in the public interest and supports the federal interest in eradicating bias-motivated violence referenced in section 249B1C of Title 18 United States Code. That section of the United States Code describes a hate crime for us. And it says that it's what it, what it is is when somebody willfully, quote, uh, causes, uh, you know, causes through the willful action bodily injury to any person or through the use of fire, a firearm, a dangerous weapon, or an explosive or incendiary device attempts to cause bodily injury to any person because of the actual or perceived religion, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. Do you see what's going on here? <clears throat> this bill is presented as necessary because of an interest in better understanding hate crime and being of public and federal interest to eradicate it, but it cites a report that includes incidents that overwhelmingly are not crimes by federal law's own definition. It also says that hate crimes have dramatically increased, again, based on the same report that conflates crimes and non-crimes, while simultaneously declaring a need to better understand the problem. And then we see the following in subsection 5 in lines 18 through 24, where it says, quote, a complete understanding of the national problem posed by hate crimes is hindered by incomplete data from federal, state, and local jurisdictions through the Uniform Crime Reports Program. Hmm. Now we're starting to understand what this bill really does. It expands an existing reporting program by telling us there is a problem that needs addressed, but we don't have a complete understanding of the problem without more information. Think of it this way. You tell your best friend that you know your significant other is cheating on you. When your friend asks you how you know this, you tell them that your significant other has been going to the store more frequently. And when your friend inquires, well, how much more frequently, you tell them you don't really know exactly how much more, but you need to start recording your significant other's trips to the store and maybe their mileage too. In other words, you don't really know, but you want to utilize resources to collect information because you think you know. And that is exactly what this bill does. It expands this data collection program by incentivizing states to accept grant money, which puts them on the hook for reporting hate crimes, to its Uniform Crime Reports program. It allows states to offer subgrants to local governments who comply, who are then authorized to provide that funding to local law enforcement agencies. Ha! Now, wait a minute. Remember HB1 a few moments back? The one here in Florida that prohibits local agencies from defunding the police? And then how it provides incentives for local government to potentially increase policing just to protect against civil liability? Put these two together. You have a recipe for local governments to petition the state of Florida to participate in this program. I imagine something similar might exist in other states. And that participation would give Florida federal money who could then provide grants to local governments who might want to increase law enforcement in order to protect themselves against future civil liability. And all they need to do is participate in reporting, the fed, reporting, the federal, uh, reporting to the federal reporting program. Here is the cherry on top which I'm going to be honest, I'm speculating without any supporting evidence. This bill asserts a dramatic rise in hate crimes on scant and conflated evidence. 
I want you to imagine that federal funds end up depending on finding a certain number of hate crimes. After all, there is an incentive to justify the passage of the bill and expansion of the Uniform Crime Reports program to include state and local reporting. But for now, that's all for this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And to catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head on over to facebook.com forward slash free speech media network where the weekly episode of Just Me airs Monday nights at 8 p.m. Or join Josh Fields from the Libertarian Apothecary and me on Friday night at 11 p.m. as we discuss, uh, as we have a discussion style episode of the same topic. And while you're there, be sure to check out other free speech media shows. Remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time, and I'm out.